Okay, we're recording now. If you don't want to be seen on the camera, you can uh, turn off your video. But welcome to uh, the kickoff meeting. This is for the project AE001, AE standing for Advanced Electrical, 001 being the inaugural project. Exciting, exciting. Um, so yeah, here's some background. Uh, Mark V has a sensing suite, as you may or may not be familiar with, that's ready to be integrated onto the vehicle. And there are two important things to remember for this. One is that analog sensing circuitry is very sensitive to external environment. Um, and analog circuitry is only as robust as its power supply rail. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I had another slide where this is like underlined just to kind of like, you know, emphasize that this is what we're talking about here. Um, yeah. <laughs> So why? Don't, don't read all of this. I'm going to talk about this and then you can read it if it didn't make sense. So disclaimer is flowing from right to left because when I started making this, the stuff was kind of on the right hand side and I just went to the left. I know it doesn't make sense, but this is what we have. All right. So everyone here took ISIM, uh, which means that you're familiar with the concept of analog sensing. We have some circuit that's referenced to a power, VCC, and a ground, which is our zero volt reference and it's collecting some info from the outside world. Goes into your circuit. The circuit then references this information uh, as a value between your, your power, your VCC, and your ground. So then you get some output that's referenced to these two things. And then that output is usually pretty small, so we have to amplify it. So then that output gets amplified and you have your amplified output. That amplified output can go to a microcontroller, some digital logic, whatever whatever you're sending whatever you're using the data for in our case it's probably an adc on a microcontroller an adc is an analog to digital converter so converting that analog information into digital information okay so now we can walk through these five kind of things uh and hopefully this explanation will be even more clear so we're converting info from the world into a signal and that signals amplitude so like the waveform's height is in reference to the circuits VCC and ground. Uh, that output signal is used by microcontrollers, us, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So now getting into the weeds of this. If VCC or the ground reference shift, which is very possible because in the world, there are flowing currents. It might be on your PCB. There might be magnetic interference. There might be something that couples with your power or your ground, meaning that the levels which they were initially at might shift a little bit. And over time, maybe something can get very far away from what you'd expect, or maybe just a little bit. But the point is, if VCC and ground begin to shift, our output signal becomes unpredictable. The same value that we're sensing one day might be different from the value we sense another day because of these inconsistencies. So if that signal is then amplified, the error is also amplified, meaning that the info that we thought is accurate in our digital world is no longer accurate, or we don't know if it's accurate. And that kind of takes away the whole point of sensing because sensing is all about precise, preciseness and accuracy. So that was my little spiel about why this, is, this matters. Um, going back to this slide, uh, we're talking about the power supply here. The analog sensing circuitry is all designed. It's well done and good. Lots of considerations were made and we're excited to roll it out but we wanna make sure that it is stable and protected uh, and is as robust as its power supply rail. So this is where we come in. Um, we hypothesize that our current buck converters on the PCBs are not uh, well equipped enough to make this, uh, to have our sensing circuitry work at its full potential. So we're exploring different things. Okay, so project requirements. We want to provide a great power supply for our analog sensing circuitry. And these are some metrics we want to use, but we have not quantified a value for yet. Um, and we'll talk about all of these in depth over the course of this project, so don't worry if you're not familiar with some of these terms. The voltage ripple uh, is kind of like this. Our buck converter is a switching converter, so the output is kind of like a wavy line. It's not like a steady five volts. If you squint hard enough, it might look like a steady five volts. But if you zoom really far in, it's like it's bouncing up and down. It's doing its thing. That's the voltage ripple. And we want to minimize that voltage ripple for 
modern computers like your Intel CPU in your Olin laptop, the tolerances are very low. Like it can only allow for less than, I don't know, maybe five millivolts peak to peak. On formula that we allow up to 20 millivolts peak to peak, which is much more generous. And for our sensing circuitry, it might need to be somewhere in between, maybe 10. We don't know, we have to do a little bit of research there. Next, we wanna test its stability under load. So power supplies output a constant voltage. But we know from Ohm's law, V equals IR, if a current is suddenly drawn, if there's a change in current, our voltage will change. So a load is basically a resistor. We could think of a load as a resistor, and that could be our circuit, an LED, a microcontroller, whatever. When we introduce different loads, if our microcontroller is turning on this LED, it's sending a CAN message, it's doing this, doing that, the load will be constantly changing. So we want to make sure that this bumpy waveform doesn't spike up and down every time we turn an LED on or, or do something very simple. That's something we want to protect against. Efficiency, we want to be efficient. We have a finite amount of energy in our car because it's a battery. Uh, the battery will run out of charge eventually. So we want to make sure that we're not just wasting power in this operation. Next is cost. We don't have infinite money. Unfortunately, if we did, we wouldn't have to worry about this. Next is the footprint. The footprint is literally how big the circuit is. Like on your PCB, we have a finite amount of space on the car too because of mechanical constraints. Uh, so we want to optimize between an effective power converter and one that's small enough um, that still does well enough. And environmentally robust, meaning that the environment of our car is not necessarily a nice, peaceful, quiet one. Our car can get hot or it vibrates a lot or random shit can literally get into the enclosures like leaves and dirt and gravel. And we want to make sure that our circuitry is safe and protected against that. So that's a big spiel about like stuff that we want to focus on for this project. Uh, I'm going to take a second to pause here because uh, if you all have any questions about what I just talked about, I can explain it again or try explaining it differently. Or we can keep moving, whatever you want. Also, there's like 15 slides, so uh, we have all the time in the world. Um, ask away if you have questions. How do you determine the number of like microcontrollers on a power supply? Or just yeah, like any question. circuit in general, I guess? Great question. Um, there's many considerations for deciding how much to have on one power converter. The biggest things we consider on this team is we want to make sure that we're not like sending converted power over like wires between enclosures because wires have some resistance in them, which means that you'll experience some losses, which means that if you have five volts on one enclosure and you're sending the five volts through a wire to another enclosure, that doesn't mean five volts is showing up here. Maybe you'll get 4.8 volts. That's probably sufficient, but you never know. We also have separate power converters for every single PCB on our car. I personally think that this is not the best practice because we don't need to do it, but it makes sure that everyone's project is discrete, which means that if someone's power converter sucks or their PCB sucks, yours is not screwed over by it. Those are like the two considerations we make on this team. Uh, as for the number of microcontrollers, we decide the number of microcontrollers based on what we have to do. For the BMS, which is doing a lot of math, we need a more hefty microcontroller. So we use a more, uh, we use one with more flash storage. For most projects on the car, you could probably stick a bunch of them onto one microcontroller and call it a day. But again, ownership of projects, discrete separate boards, necessitates having a lot of microcontrollers. For sensing, specifically, there are these things called ADCs, analog to digital converters. And every microcontroller has a finite number of them. So if you're sensing a bunch of different things, maybe your microcontroller doesn't have enough ports. Maybe you need another one. Now, that's not exactly what you're supposed to be doing. There's other electronics you could introduce that'll free up bandwidth, if that made sense. Um, but your microcontroller is constrained by certain things. Sometimes you need more to do more things, or you need more to do different things, or whatever. Uh, ideally, one microcontroller for a power source. Hey, Ali, thanks for joining. Uh, we're only a couple of slides in. 
Uh, I can just refresh it, honestly. Uh, there's a kickoff meeting, some background. Analog circuitry is sensitive to its environment, and we want to make sure that it's robust. And to ensure that, we need a good power supply. That's what we're doing. This is a little deal. I'm recording this, so you can go back and watch this later. It was like a five minute explanation. Awesome. Yep. Okay. And we just talked about these metrics, which we'll be revisiting countless times throughout this project. Okay, project scope. What are we doing? So we're exploring different regimes of power supplies, meaning we're trying different configurations. Uh, we are developing good schematic capture and layout practices for power electronics. This is important because I think we, myself included, suffer in terms of good schematic capture and good layout practices sometimes. So this is a great way to practice and get better at it. Power electronics is a great mix of uh, working with different frequencies, heat dissipation, footprint, the whole shebang. It's kind of nice. Next, we want to try to implement more sophisticated designs. So taking our existing design a step further. OK, what we are not, we're not expecting this to be perfect the first time. This coupon is meant to be a test bed to see if it'll even work. It's OK if it doesn't work. We will be doing enough analysis to know if it does work before we ship it, but there's no guarantee. Uh, it'll probably work, but just just, you know, just in case. And then we are not designing the analog circuitry. That's already done. We're designing this for the analog circuitry. That's already done. And last but not least, we are not cutting any corners. This is going to be thoroughly documented. This is going to be very good. This is going to be very good. I mean, I said that twice because it's going to be very good. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm super hyped. I think that this team we have is, is very strong. Um, and we can make a kick-ass power supply. Okay, Confluence. Y'all may or may not have seen this page already. Uh, I made a requirements page. That link lives in the Power Coupons channel. So the goals from this are to practice good documentation because I think all of us have room for improvement there. Uh, we want to set an example for the team because as many people have expressed, there is no good reference for confluence. Like, how do you know what good documentation is? What can we emulate, right? So we can forge kind of the example. And we want to start as like a jumping off point for future design. So if anyone wants to do a power converter design in the future, they could say, hey, this team made these considerations a couple of years ago. Um, how can we, you know, how can we jump off this instead of redoing everything? Okay. Quick review, linear supply versus switch mode power supply. Um, linear supply has a linear relationship between power in and power out. What that means is that any energy that you're not taking out in your voltage out line is just thrown away, lost to heat, resistive losses. The simplest form of a linear su power supply is a voltage divider with two resistors. You have your five volts in, you have a resistor, you have voltage out, you have a resistor, you have ground. And then this is based on the fraction of your resistors and you all have done this map before. If you want me to do a quick review on how to do that map, I can do that right now on the whiteboard, but um, I'm gonna trust that you all know that. Switch mode power supply is more efficient and has its own sets of quirks, but at its core, it is taking an input power and turning it off and on really quickly so that we get some voltage out. And that voltage out is just the average time you're on. Now, I know I'm explaining a lot of things very quickly, not in depth, and this is pretty technical. And I have resources for this, but I just want to quickly gleam over everything and then get come back and visit all this stuff. I just want to get through the material first. Um, so here's a pros, cons kind of um, list of why one is better than the other. So for linear supplies, they're low noise because there's no switching. Switching introduces noise because then you have high frequency waves that can couple with your signals, causing weird things to happen. It could interfere with your steady voltage out that we're trying to achieve. It could interfere with your other signals. We don't know. A downside is lower efficiency because like I mentioned earlier, everything is just thrown away, what we're not using. 
Whereas in a switch mode power supply, the converter is just off. So we're not really throwing away much. We're losing some through conduction and switching, and we'll talk about that later, but it's, it's much more efficient. A linear supply is much more simple. Usually, you have your voltage source, you have a linear regulator chip, you have ground, and you have like two capacitors. And then slap it on, call it a day, and you have your five volts, your three volts, or whatever you want. They're compact because maybe one chip and two capacitors, whatever, right? You have like a handful of components, very small. Downside of them, they get pretty hot because everything is being dissipated to resistance and heat. Now, on the other side of the boat, switch mode power supplies. They're high noise. There's a lot of switching going on, all kinds of stuff. There's an inductor. So that's in introducing a huge magnetic aspect. They're much higher efficiency. Uh, they're much more complicated. You might have seen the buck converter has like, I don't know, 20 parts on it. And we might be making that even more complex to increase filtering and make it better and yada, yada. So in terms of actually getting the design right the first time, it's a lot harder than a linear supply because it's pretty hard to screw those up. Then larger footprint. So literally it takes up a lot of space on your board because there's a lot of parts. Inductors, massive. Any magnetic component, massive. In relationship to other pieces, but they're much larger than your other, than your other pieces. Advantage is that it's less hot, which is arguable because the switching chip can get hot, but since you have a larger area to dissipate the heat over, you can achieve lower temperatures than with a linear power supply. And that was, that's the caveat there. Um, that was a lot of information. We will revisit this, I promise. So overarching ideas. These are kind of what we want to try. So um, first, we have a power in. And then that's like our battery power, 12 volts, 18 volts, whatever. It goes into our power stage. Power stage is the fancy word I'm using to describe our power converter. Then we have our analog circuitry. So the simplest, simplest thing we could do, slap a linear regulator on there. Power in through a linear regulator goes to an analog circuit. Easy. Second, power in, buck converter, analog circuitry. Easy. Actually, we already have that. We don't even have to do that. Okay? So that part is done for us. That's simple. That's kind of like our control group for this experiment. Now let's take it a step further. So now we have a power in and we have a two stage converter. Non isolated, I'll talk about that in a second. So first we get past the power in through a buck converter and then we achieve a lower voltage with a high efficiency. And then we step it down just a little bit more through a linear regulator to get rid of all the switching noise and we have a nice steady output waveform. Now that includes more design, more components, more of everything and eventually hits our analog circuitry. Maybe this will be sufficient. Maybe we have a nice, great power rail that's stable for analog circuit just from this. How does the linear regulator get rid of the noise of the buck converter? So a linear regulator has literally no switching, right? It's a resistive component. And the way resistors act in the real world is that they're like, they're kind of like dampers. They're filters in their own sense. Um, I can't explain it very quantitatively right now, but at a qualitative level, I'll say that it removes a lot of the bumps um, in our waveform. Cool. Yes. One more thing I will say is that let's say our buck converter is outputting six volts and then our linear regulator is stepping six volts to five volts. Um, it's going to keep the five volts it likes and get rid of the other one volt. Oh. So does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Is, would uh -oh. your linear regulator be like a voltage divider or would it be like a little IC chip or something or? It, it would be an IC. We're not, we're not going to use uh, resistor dividers. Okay. Cool. Why wouldn't you just use an IC for the whole thing? Because these are two separate functions that are being achieved. Okay. Yeah. There's probably something that does both. Um, yeah. Wesley, well, so you got something? Yeah. I was going to say um, the reason why you wouldn't want to just use a linear regulator on its own is because stepping, like, say, 12 volts down to 5 volts, you're stepping down 7 volts there. And all that, um, all that power is going to be lost to heat versus okay. a buck converter stepping down six volts, 
that you're only losing like one volt that gotcha. you're going to heat. So it's not going to heat up as much as you be more efficient. So we could do some quick math here. Um, if you think about stepping 12 volts to 5 volts on a linear regulator, your, your efficiency is literally 5 twelfths because you're keeping 5 twelfths of the energy, 42% or whatever that is. Um, if you think of your buck converter with about 90% efficiency, um, stepping 12 volts to 6 volts at 90% means we're losing 10% of 6 volts, which is a sixth of a volt. And then we're losing that last one sixth. You could do whatever addition, multiplication, proportion stuff you need to factor there. Okay, the next step of this is making an isolated two stage converter. And what I mean by isolated is that we separate grounds. Now, please don't ask me to elaborate on this further because this is something I need to research myself also. Um, but from what I understand, having separate ground planes reduces noise greatly for analog circuitry. In more sophisticated designs, you might see your analog circuits all on one ground plane in the corner, and then the rest doing their own thing like over here with a different ground plane. Now, of course, you wanna make sure those ground planes don't shift in relationship to each other because then you're referencing your voltages differently, but there's workarounds for that. But it's providing a nice ground reference for your analog circuitry, which is what this isolation will achieve. Something to try. Um, I don't know if it'll work. I've personally never even seen one of these. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it doesn't even make any sense, but we shall see. Uh, and last, we want to have lots of filtering. This is just a random filter I pulled online. Like, <laughs> there's, a, there's a choke here, which is like an inductive component. There's some capacitors, and you, know, you have ground. Whatever, right? It's a filter. We want to try lots of different filters. Um, and we're going to do this thing called package protecting. And what that means is that we're going to stick on like a thousand, not a thousand, maybe like a dozen footprints for capacitors and inductors and resistors and whatever that we don't have to populate. But if we want to populate, we can and see how this filter works versus this filter. And that lets us hold off on making finalized decisions until the last second. Then when we find what we like, we pick exactly the configuration we like, slap it on a PCB and it's sent right? We get to do all of this kind of stuff without any regard for space, really, um, for this project, because it's purely for experimentation. Um, so yes, we, we get to do things that we don't normally get to do, which is exciting. And last, I'm going to leave you with some action items, and then we'll go back and talk about some other stuff. But so I listed my stuff first, because that's what I was thinking about. I got to learn more about separating grounds, because I don't know much about it. Uh, I'm going to prepare a short assignment for y'all to familiarize yourselves uh, with the basics of power supplies. Expect it to be like one page of questions. It won't be too hard. Um, and then I'm going to curate a short list of resources, which I want y'all to poke at. You don't have to look at them, but probably advisable. Next, I want you three, uh, Ali, Izzy, and Shri, to watch the buck converter lecture from March, which I gave on the OEM YouTube. It lives there. It's, I've watched it a couple of times in retrospect and it's, I'd say it's strongly okay. It'll get you the information you need to know. Could it be better? Yes, but I think that it's a good jumping off point. And then I'll send you this worksheet, hopefully by Saturday. Um, and then I want you all to finish that by our next meeting. Uh, I wanna ask you all this real quick. Does this time on Thursdays work for you for a repeating meeting time? Or do we want to find a more permanent, uh, like a different permanent time? All I don't good? care, it works for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, great. And last but not least, enjoy the long weekend. Or don't, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> now. Floor is open for questions. If you want me to touch on anything that we talked about earlier, or you're confused about something, or whatever, we have, we have, we have some time. Do we have access to this slideshow? Yeah, I think it's in uh, OEM Drive 2021 Electrical Advanced AE001. Make sure you all read the confluence beforehand. 
Um, and then we need to figure out how we're going to document well, because I, I haven't thought too much about it yet. That's it. Then um, we could call it. Thanks for joining y'all. Have a good night. Thank you too. Yep.